and we're going to put it on the effect of choosing a product in shape gradient descent, as hopefully you can see, seeing the TV is working. So, investigating uh, the impact of the choice of a product on gradient descent for shape optimization. For gradient descent, we need to choose an inner product, as Alberto just explained to us, and then, like, why do we use a particular inner product? What effect does that have? So, this is shape optimization. You have your set of shapes, you minimise it, again, things Alberto has explained to you. Shapes is trans. So if I'm, as I'm about to a PhD student, I'm using the same um, diffeomorphism based shape optimization schemes. So we have this, so we need, we need to find, we have our directional derivatives which are functional, so we need to then map that back into our primal space so we can do a gradient descent. This is the, and yeah, if it's sufficiently smooth, then it's the first derivative which is in the dual space, map back to the primal space by race representations which thing gives us the gradient, it's the race representation problem. This looks suspiciously like the sort of weight formulation that Firedrake is very good for, which is another elegant thing about using Firedrake for fire shapes. <laughs> You're like solving problems that it's already good at. It turns out it's equivalent to steepest descent, you can push some algebra around and show that. Steepest descent with respect to the norm induced by the inner product, which gives a nicer intuition to sort of understanding what the inner product means in a sort of, ge gives you sort of geometrical intuition, like you can more easily understand what sort of deformations of the initial shape are being penalised by the inner product in, in, a, in a steepest descent context and you can even try to come up with your own terms. If you don't want it doing a certain thing, you can just sort of throw a semi-norm in and it should do less of that. <laughs> so that's kind of a way that I like to think of it. We compute the gradients numerically, you get... Sorry, I thought I took this slide, sorry, I thought I took this slide out, sorry. Um, so, yeah, you've got your weight formulation, we're solving it directly at the moment because that works okay. We haven't... Iterative solvers are fiddly. And not yet, and not needed in two dimensional cases, which we're working with. If we're moving to three dimensions, then yeah, we'd probably consider switching to iterative solvers just for performance reasons, since we've had so many degrees of freedom. So, which inner products would we use? So, we sort of have three obvious inner products to try on functions on this sort of space of diffeomorphisms L2, H1, H2. So L2 doesn't work, we don't get sufficiently continuous, the gradients that we get as the race representative is not sufficiently continuous, so that's right out. H1 is popular, we have a finite element that's conforming with it, which is Lagrange, because we need one degree of continuity, C0. So then we want to try H1, that's like the next inner product to try. So H2, sorry. So the reason we might, so we need H2, but we are getting the extra H2 semi-norm, which is penalising large second derivatives. So going back to the way you might think about it geometrically, that's like an extra thing we can add in. How we might wonder what the effect on the final shape will be. So if there's a unique optimum, it's going to still approach that optimum kind of from different directions in the control space, which is infinite dimensional, so I don't expect you to visualise that. But it's going to approach in different directions, then when we hit the convergence criteria, you'll get different shapes. So, this is a little bit awkward. We could use an Argyris element, that's C1, we don't have enough continuity. Argyris elements have quite poor performance. I do need to look into how much that poor performance is related to inefficient interpolation. I should profile my code actually and see whether it's, abstract, whether it's mostly just that the problem has more degrees of freedom and or worse conditions, I believe it's worse conditions, or whether it's just that there's an interpolation and inefficiency that I should address. But the primary thing that we're using for this is, <coughs> is an interior penalty method with Lagrange elements. So we have C0, we then impose, we have C0 elements, we then we have our H2 in a product, and then we add some beta which I think is proportional to 1 over h. 
There's a formula. It, so we, we could also do this with computing fully DG elements. So we'd have to add plus alpha and then just the jump of u and the jump of w. That alpha grows a lot faster with h than beta, which makes things get very ill-conditioned very quickly. So we decided, decided not to do that. But that this is a nice balance between very large penalty terms and Argyrus awkwardness is to go with, yes, kind of get one degree of continuity from our space and then another degree from the penalty. So we probably want to show that this actually converges to the inner, uh, this converges with H. So as we refine H, so note that this is the broken Laplace. We'll be using the broken second derivative, so we're not, we're, we're because <coughs> U and W aren't C1 continuous, so we can't just say they're second derivative. We actually just define the second derivative on the interior of the cells, where it's polynomial, and just ignore the, the boundaries and hope that this penalty term forces the errors due to this continuity in the boundaries to, to be fit to converge to zero, and then we don't need to worry about that. So, we probably want it to actually converge, so we have two variational problems. We want to show that the solution of one to converge to the solution of the other as h tends to zero. So, I haven't finished doing this, but we can approach it using Strang's second lemma, where we bound it in terms of these two terms. This term we can bound with fairly standard results. This one I'm still working on, it involves some slightly awkward projections between disk more or less continuous function spaces and hopefully that will be done fairly shortly once I've fiddled around with some limits and bounds and all that good stuff. So we should probably test it, we will test it. Simplest test case, level set problem for shape optimization. you have some function, some function f, it's a fixed function, this is basically a parameter function, and then it's going to go to the region where it's negative because that's going to minimise the integral over the region. So we construct them as sine basically as, so you have some shape, sine distance function just looks like, say you've got a regular polygon, it just looks like a pyramid, or for a circle it's a cone. Just because these are easy to implement in fire drake, you can either reduce with fire drake maps, actually minor comment for the developers, it would be really nice if fire drake maps would take to take a list so I don't have to be using using it at all. Is it it at all or reduce? <laughs> currently <laughs> maps is on, currently fire drake maps is a later nine because it was a binary operator, but that's a oh, it's UFL, UFL, I see. Oh okay, it's a UFL I see, yeah. Um, UFL maps is, bi is binary, could it be enary? Because like it can be and it's slightly annoying to have to fill around with reduce and stuff. Anyway, or it's just a cone at which point that's Fairly easy to do. <laughs> like root x squared plus y squared. So that's how we are testing this. There is one consideration with these particular choice of level set function, which is then I don't know if there are issues arising with the fact that the values are small near the boundary, so it might not particularly care about getting close when it's already close. But on the other hand, that means that it will kind of care more about things that are further from the boundary. It will have a greater derivative, which is probably actually good. We usually try with the sign of this. I suspect it would be worse and it would <coughs> oscillate and you'd have continuity issues. Um, so we've got some results. We try to rotate a square. We start with a square that's on the square and then try to take it off the square. So with an H1 in a product, it just moves this corner straight down here, bends out a new corner here. And you've got your target shape, which is roughly that. With an H2 in a product, I haven't fully done it, but it's tried to bring it round. So I've tried to bring this corner round here. It's a little bit pointy, even though it's the true corner, the actual corner should be over here. I suspect with a smaller rotation, I wonder if the smaller rotation will work correctly. But yeah, so this is, this is a fairly early result, hence why the graphs don't look like anything else. I was having some trouble getting this to replicate with my current system, which is something I need to look into. So you can see some difference in behaviour. This corner is preserved. It doesn't seem to get rid of it. And this is more. This it's not particularly sharp in either case, actually. But the behaviour of this is quite interesting. It sort of brought the whole mesh around. Just here, take it. So 
So here we have some more recent results creating a corner. So we started with a circle, so our underlying mesh is circle. And then we try to make it that we have our target, we, we're trying to make it into a triangle, so our target function is like an upside down tetrahedron. So we can see here that the H1 forms, a, it stretched the mesh a lot, these are long sections, and it's formed fairly pointy. H2 Argyrus and H2 Lagrange are very smooth, have kind of smoothed out the corner. Now, the thing to note that Argyrus and Lagrange don't give the same results. I'm assuming this is due to some amount of some amount of error introduced due to the penalty process. It's not exactly C1, it's approximately, I think it's gonna be approximately C1. I don't exactly know. Um, so this is an example of the kind of reluctance to create and form new corners with an H2 product. Uh, so I wanted to quantify this. So I thought I would plot, so all the way around, we plot the angle that it makes, like how sharply it bends at each vertex on the y-axis. On the x-axis, we've just got the polar theta coordinates, so just like how far round it, it, its bearing from the origin is, just as a way of, as an easy way of parameterizing our shape, because our shapes are mostly regular stuff centered on the origin. So I just needed some parameterization for this. Okay, so, what we, so you can see here we've got a much sharper jump up. Also, yes, we have got a horizontal line down there because I didn't rotate my vectors around the right way. <laughs> Oops. But, you, but we've, got, and we've got a much bigger peak from H1, the same colour and um, style of the lines as before. Then you've got less of a peak on Aguirre, even less on on Lagrange H2, so, you've got, so this is sort of a more quantitative way of seeing it. We could use some sort of thresholding approach to try to count how many corners are formed. I've had some luck with that. However, this raises some technical things about fire drink that I want to talk about. So it's non trivial to find the perimeter. I have a mesh, it has no labeling because Gmesh gave it to me. I can, I can extract the exterior facets. But then, so I have a mesh, I get the exterior facets with the, by reusing some of the label code from Triplot, to, I think it's from Triplot, to figure out, I wrote this code a while ago, to figure out which edges are on the boundary. If once I've got which edges, that was not the issue. Once I've got which edges are on the boundary, I then need to, re I, I don't know what order they're in. So I need to like get a list of all the vertex pairs and manually stick them together to make a loop, which, I mean, I can do that, it's not that hard, but I'm kind of interested whether there's a way to extract the entire boundary as a single kind of object with its topology rather than lay, just labelling the edges, extracting them and having to reassemble it. I suspect I've overlooked a bit of fire drake functionality. Secondly, mesh coordinates have side effects. This threw me a little bit. Uh, there are certain things down like mesh.coordinate stop, etc., that just don't exist until you've accessed mesh.coordinates, at which point they start existing. Yeah, we know it's meshing it, it's hard. <laughs> I know, but it's also like it slightly weird and counterintuitive. Uh, yeah, so we've got to read we, once we've got, once we got the list, we just do trig on them. Uh, I don't know if I'm doing this the right way, this is a horrible hack and there's like a, a function that already does this for me. So if you just want the perimeter, could you just integrate a field that's one with the DS, which is the exterior facet measure? Yeah. And so also, the first thing is... I, want this, I, need, I, need, I need the coordinates of all the vertices on the exterior in order. You, 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 want, you, want, you want the surface mesh. Yeah. So, so, okay, so, so G-mesh will label the boundaries for you. They're somehow... Get, yeah, I've managed to relabel the boundary, but somehow get unlabeled during the optimization process. Then that's not G-mesh, right? Yeah, yeah so I think it's, it's, it's either my fault or Alberto's fault, it's probably my fault. <laughs> <laughs> um, but G-Mesh is totally not robust, with respect to nose labeling, right? From Sorry? G-Mesh is notoriously not robust with respect to labeling the boundaries correctly. So that's okay, I've managed to label, I've managed to label G the boundary. G-Mesh boundary loading works. Sorry. This is not, this is not like the primary, my primary question. My primary question here is, that it doesn't, I'll, I'll hold it as in the Q&A afterwards, but that I can't, it, but that once I've laid right, I don't seem to be able to pull the whole thing out in order. So, why, like, order isn't really a concept that exists on that show, I don't really... A little bit of 
problem there. Um, <laughs> okay, so that's that. Sorry, I'm already flipping this over. So, should we move on? We okay, can, fine. We can talk about it later. Um, yeah. Um, so, interestingly in this case, when I was going from a triangle to a circle, it just very quickly got rid of the, of the corners, which is kind of interesting how it did this very readily, in fact, converged in two iterations. We should probably look at it converging. Here it is converging. This is uh, the J minus, this is our target function, the difference between that and the, and, the pos and the theoretical minimum. So you can see H1 converges quicker because I think it kind of has less qualms about making the pointy corner where the pointy corner should be, etc. So it's interesting to see that the H2 inner products converge slower. Lagrange seems both more reluctant to create new corners and also correspondingly converges slow. I don't know if that's a coincidence. Why the interior penalty method is behaving like that, but you do note that the ones that round the corners more converge less well, as you'd expect, and H1 converges quicker because I suppose it's sort of less constrained in where to go, and this is a very wishy-washy way of thinking about it. I mean, you should know a more vigorous way. And then we do the PDE constraint optimization, where we have, say, a pipe. We want to optimize the flow of fluid through it. Uh, H2 was originally an S-bend. H2 preserves those shapes more. So in summary, we can compute H2 with C0IP, need to prove it converges. Seems to have interesting qualitative differences. Qualitatively, um, we to, we should also need to investigate the, 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 how regular the H2 gradients actually are as gradients in themselves, rather than not so much the convergence, but are they, what sort of smoothness does the boundary have, etc. And also, H2 gets ill conditioned using either method fairly quickly and is then also pre Thank you. Sorry that I'm very sorry that I'm not.